When I say the word antichrist, what comes to your mind? What pops in? What thoughts? What images? Take a second to have a conscious thought about that. Well, if you do a Google search, if you type in antichrist, uh, you come up with a lot of different sites and sources, uh, lots of pagan symbols, demonic images, Surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, a lot of political figures are mentioned. There are religious banners that you can find. Uh, I even found a movie trailer. I guess they made, it was eight years ago, they made a movie called Antichrist. Uh, Why you would want to make a movie about Antichrist, I don't know. I, I didn't watch the movie. I won't endorse the movie. I think it was uh, rated R, so it's probably not a good movie. Uh, But there's a whole plethora of ideas out there uh, of who or what is or will be the Antichrist. One interesting thing to note, uh, I think it was ninth or 10th down on the list of Google search results uh, results was United Church of God. They had an article about Antichrist, which is pretty high up there considering uh, the topic. Um, So that was encouraging, although I clicked the article and I did read it. It was very fine. Uh, In the comments... It didn't take long for it to delve into misinformation. Uh, I was going through and um, one person commented and said, you know, uh, Antichrist is obviously Pope Francis. Uh, then I said, well, no, obviously it's President Donald Trump. Uh, but any, you can go and you search for these things and you get answers anywhere from political figures, says President Trump or maybe President Obama, the Pope, all the way to aliens. Aliens being the Antichrist. I would not recommend reading most of those things. They're not worth, I don't want to steal it again, but they're not worth our conscious thought for a lot of those things. They're misinformation, um, but there's so much out there, so much misinformation out there. And what always strikes a note with me about the obsession of this topic, and a lot of topics actually, but this one in particular was on my mind, um, is where the focus is. You hear the word antichrist, and you see all the information, and the focus is almost universally uh, on the obsession with, is on the knowledge of end time fulfillments. Who, the what, who will be the antichrist? When will the antichrist come? Serving only to indulge curiosity or perhaps personal pride of I know who these things what, what uh, kind of jogged me on this topic several weeks ago is I got a question about Antichrist. They have questions that come in, people from the website, and they assign them out. And the one that I got was about Antichrist. And the focus wasn't about how do, what should I understand about Antichrist, but the who and the what and the when. The who, the what, and the when. Normally, there's not a message within the topic of Antichrist of, Uh, and I think it applies to a lot of prophecy that this is the case, but there's not a a message of change and turning towards God. How should this affect my life? It's about specific end-time fulfillments and knowing how these things will play out. The question is not usually brought up, how is this supposed to change my life and how I live my life? So the question to us is, do we understand properly what the Bible says and what it doesn't say about Antichrist? More importantly, though, do we learn what God is trying to teach us through his inspired word when he uses the term Antichrist? Ultimately, when we read God's word, it should be uh, as a sharp-edged sword to our own individual hearts, inspiring us to change our lives to become like God and his son, Jesus Christ. And that applies to when we read the word Antichrist as well. We can understand certain things and and ponder, speculate on certain things, but really the question is, how should this change my life when we read Scripture? So today, we're going to look at the topic. Who or what is the Antichrist, and what should it mean for us as Christians today? Well, my notes are upside down. There we go. So to start, the word Antichrist is used only five times in the whole of Scripture. Five times. All of them coming from the writings of the Apostle John, and not in his Gospel account, but only in his epistles that he wrote. First and Second John specifically. Uh, we, can start, we can turn to First John, 
Uh, but the word Antichrist is an English word that we use, but it's translated from the original Greek, Antichristos. So it's a pretty good uh, transliteration, almost like an Anglized, Anglized, Anglized English version of the Greek, Antichristos. And Antichristos is made up of two Greek words, anti and Christos. Christos referring to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and anti meaning against, adversary, or in place of. So literally the word means adversary of Christ. Adversary of Christ. And those words are, are familiar to us. We think of anti-gun law. You're against gun laws. Anti-abortion. You're against abortion. Well, in this case, anti-Christos against Christ, or adversary of Christ. So we find these instances within of occurrence of this word in 1 John, the first one occurring in chapter 2 and verse 18. Let's, we're going to go ahead and read the different uh, times this word is used, and we'll come back and, and, and get more in depth with it. But the first one is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Let's see what we can find out here from where these words are used. 1 John 2 and verse 18 says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. So two of the five occurrences occur of this word occur in this one verse, and we have a distinction here. The first one says, uh, we have heard the Antichrist is coming. Now the article the is in the Greek, so and the it's rightly capitalized in many translations as a capital A, referring to an individual, a specific person. The Antichrist is coming, a future fulfillment. But the other side of it is, the other use of the word, even now many Antichrists, that's the plural version of it, uh, many Antichrists have come. So it, even in this first verse where these words occur, we're getting... Uh, dispelling some of the typical notions of Antichrist. A lot of times when people use the word Antichrist, they're referring to an end-time figure of some sort, and obviously that's the case. There is a figure that will be the Antichrist, but John is saying many Antichrists have come. Not just one, but many. And that's at the time that John was writing this, hundreds of years ago. Let's go to the second one. We're, we'll delve more back into this a little later. But if we drop down to verse 22 in the same chapter, it says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies Father, the Father and the Son. Here we have more information about Antichrist. Again, there's on this usage, there's no article. There's no the Antichrist. But saying anyone who denies the Father and the Son is Antichrist, against or an adversary of Christ. Very interesting. Not just one person, uh, multiple people. Anybody who professes or believes this certain way is Antichrist. The next occurrence is in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Is it okay if I have this water bottle? Yes, thank you. First John chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. Here it's talking about Somebody who doesn't believe or confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that uh, position, that attitude, is the spirit of Antichrist. This is the Antichrist. The same spirit of the Antichrist. The last occurrence of this word is in 2 John. 2 John, there's only one chapter, so it's chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 John 1, verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming or is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So again, this is not talking about a specific person, but 
anybody, many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus as coming in the flesh. We'll touch more about the as coming. It's a, it's a present perfective word. Um, as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So then, we have to ask ourselves some questions, maybe about some of the preconceived ideas we've had about the Antichrist. Is the Antichrist the beast power that we read about in Revelation? You know, this end-time political figure. Is the Antichrist the false prophet? Again, in Revelation 13, 14, uh, talking about an end-time figure, uh, a religious figure. Well, we've just read all the occurrences of the word Antichrist, and the Bible ex- specifically extends the title to neither of these. Well, the Bible doesn't specifically say that. Now, we can speculate one way or another, and we can read in Scripture the descriptions of these end-time figures and say, uh, maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't. But in the most literal sense of the word, against Christ, adversary of Christ, who is the ultimate Antichrist? Satan. Satan is the ultimate Antichrist, the ultimate source of this spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of uh, being an adversary of Christ. The important thing is when we're doing a study of any kind that we read the Bible for what it really says. And those are exact times that it uses the word Antichrist. So we have to understand it uses it in the context that it's in and apply it to our lives in the context that it's given and grow in the character of God. That's the way, that should be the ultimate. We should grow to uh, know what the scriptures say, understand what the scriptures say, and then how does it apply to us in our lives? Not to get bogged down in whether the Antichrist will be the beast figure or a false prophet figure or what specific person, whether they're on the scene now or, or whatever the case may be. Those are details we can speculate on, but that shouldn't be the end goal of our study of, of scripture. What is clear about the Antichrist and Antichrist, the specific person and the spirit of uh, that person, that will, person will portray, uh, is it's contrary to uh, what Jesus Christ taught. It's contrary to the nature and character of God the Father and Jesus Christ. That's the spirit of Antichrist. It's also clear that this spirit has been working for centuries through false teachers, deceivers. Those things are clearly said in these verses. We understand that uh, in other verses that false teachers and deceivers will grow worse and worse as we get closer to the end times. And every day that we live is one day closer to the end of the age, the return of Jesus Christ. So then we ask the question, how do we take that knowledge and that understanding and apply it in our lives? What's important then for us is to prepare ourselves to withstand the false doctrines, the deceptions that the spirit of Antichrist will put forth as much as possible. That's where we should understand. We should not fall into the trap of believing the spirit of Antichrist. We should not be deceived. So what I'd like to do uh, for the remainder of the time is to go back and reread these passages. We're going to go back and reread them. um, And some context plus or minus with uh, each verse and see what we can learn about how we can better uh, prepare for the deceptions that is already in the world around us and will grow worse and worse, that spirit of Antichrist. So we're going to look at three things uh, that specifically the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, is against and see how we can prepare ourselves to better uh, battle that spiritually, so to speak. So let's go to um, let's go to Second Thessalonians. Let's go to Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're going to read. We're going to. We are going to go back and read the context of of the verses that we read that contain the word antichrist. Um, but we're also going to do in each of these three areas. We're going to um, look at some end time prophecies and compare that with the spirit of Antichrist. We're not going to assign names or dates or anything. I don't think that's beneficial at this point in time, for sure. Um, but we're going to look at that and then see how that would apply to us. If, if we 
understand what's being said, what, what will be taught, um, and then how we can counteract that. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll read, um, let's read verses 3 and 4. This is Paul speaking here, and he's trying to encourage the brethren not to be deceived. And he says in verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is talking about a future fulfillment, an end time, end time figure. And in verse 4 it says, This man will oppose who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now this certainly is a spirit of Antichrist. It's against God. It's against Christ. This person, this figure, will exalt himself above God and call for himself to be worshipped as God. That certainly uh, follows in the spirit of Antichrist that we read. That's against God the Father. That's against Jesus Christ. There is a future fulfillment of a man that will come on the scene and set himself up as God. And again, whether that's the Antichrist or not, that's not for me to say, but it fulfills the spirit of Antichrist, usurping or trying to sit in the place of God. That will happen in the future. And yet, John said this is already happening back in that time and continues to this day. Let's go to um, Matthew 24. We'll see another verse here about... um, Specifically about false gods, false Christs, people setting themselves up, saying that they um, they are Christ or are God. Matthew twenty four and verse five: For many will come in my name, saying, "I am the Christ," and will deceive many. It's a it's an interesting thing if we think about it. If someone came to you today and said, "I am God, worship me as God," you'd likely think they had an imbalance of some sort in the mind. And yet, it says people will come and say, I am God, worship me as God. I am Christ and will deceive many. Will deceive many. And we can read in 2 Thessalonians further on that there's going to be signs and wonders that will go along with these figures uh, and that will help in the deception. But it begs the question, do the people who are deceived truly know God? Truly know God. If we know who God is, you wouldn't be fooled by an imposter. So as the spirit of Antichrist grows and deception about this grows, um, the challenge to us is to ask ourselves whether we truly know God or will we be fooled by a counterfeit. Let's go back to 1 John. And we're going to read um, chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 we're going to get some context now with the spirit of Antichrist. 1 John chapter 4, we'll start in verse 1. How does this apply to us? 1 John 4 and verse 1, John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The phrase there, out, gone out into the world, implies that they were once a part of, um, in the midst of, the body of Christ to go out from among them. That's something to think about. Excuse me. In verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come, past tense, in the flesh is of God. It's very important. We'll talk about that a little more. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already now in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. In verse 6, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7, Beloved, let let us love one another, for love is of God, 
And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So there's a direct correlation between love and knowing God, expressing that love and how well you know God. In verse 8, who does not love does not know God. For God is love. They go hand in hand. Uh, well, well, we've talked about this a lot in Springfield, and I was going to say, I was just going to reference it, it just came in my mind, but keep your place here, and let's go to John 17. We're talking about the concept of knowing God. In Jesus Christ, in his prayer, um, we've had several sermons in Springfield about this, uh, but in Jesus Christ's final prayer before his betrayal in the garden, he made a statement uh, in verse 3 of chapter 17 of John. He says, And this is eternal life that you may know, excuse me, that they may know you. They may know you, that's speaking of God the Father, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life that you may know God the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So do we know God the Father and the true Messiah, Jesus Christ? So let's take a step back and, and think about this, maybe from a logical concept. Um, if the deception of Antichrist is promoting a different God as God, that we read in 2 Thessalonians, in that case himself, wanting to be worshipped as God, and that deception will be and has been successful, then those who are deceived to one degree or another do not truly know God. Is that accurate to say? So then the challenge to us is to develop a deeper, closer relationship with God to better know Him. So how does that, self, how does that portray itself? How does that enact itself out? Well, that involves our, our, our daily pillars that we always talk about. Uh, having an intimate prayer life. Intimate prayer life, intimate study life. Laying ourselves bare before God in prayer. You know, humbly uh, seeking to understand His Word. As was mentioned in the sermonette, meditating. That's one of the often forgotten things. Um, of how busy we are, with how busy we are in our daily lives, taking time an hour, not, not praying, not studying, but meditating, thinking about. Uh, if our thoughts make up who we are, we want our thoughts to be uh, positive things, godly things. But those are basic ways of, of getting to know God, just developing a relationship with God. I think of it like in a very simple context, especially with Malachi. I guess they're in the back now. Um, but as Malachi's father, uh, if there was an imposter Devin, someone who pretended to be like me, Malachi would recognize that fairly immediately because we have a fairly close bond. We're, I, I love my son and we are very close together. Um, but the less you know somebody, the more likely you are to be deceived by an imposter. Someone could make themselves look like me, if we keep with this analogy. Someone could try to act like me, sound like me. Um, but the less you know me, the less you'll know the differences. You wouldn't, if you didn't, never met me before and someone said, I'm Devin Schultz, why would you not believe they're Devin Schultz? But if you knew me intimately, you would notice every little thing that was different. Devin wouldn't say those words. Devin has uh, weirder hair. Devin wears glasses, things like that. But it's about developing a relationship. The closer you are to me, the more things that are different will raise up alarms. And it's the same thing with God. The more we know God the Father and Jesus Christ, the more intimately we know, the more false gods, false Christs, will set up alarms in our head. That, that doesn't sound right with what I know about God from his word from the relationship I've developed with him. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11 as just a reference. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, along that train of thought, in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, For he who comes, if he who comes preaches another Jesus, this is Paul 
Paul's admonition to the Corinthians about false teachers, if they come preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Uh, He's saying that there are false people preaching a different Christ. Christ, but not it's an imposter Christ. The gospel, but it's an imposter gospel. So to the degree that we know and understand God, and what did we read in 1 John? Uh, if, we don't, um, if we don't love, we won't know God, which is an interesting thing to just kind of think about it. To the deg- if we think about it like this, to the degree that we uh, know and understand the love of God and show that love to God and man would be an alternate degree of how well we know God. If we think about that, how love is shown in our life would also reflect how well we know God. But that's a side point. So John's admonition in 1 John 4, when we we read through verses 1 through 8, uh, is to test the spirits. Test the spirits of whether they are God. In order to do that, we have to know God. We have to know the standard to which we're comparing. But it begs the question again, uh, what do we allow to influence and inform us about who God is? You know, that's a very uh, important thing to address as well. You know, we're told to prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Well, what defines good? What defines who God is? Well, it's God's word. It's God's word. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's a good point to make, but we live in such a fast-paced world. Um, and information is just swirling around us. Uh, always, constantly bombarding our minds. Who has the time to prove everything we hear and what we allow into our minds? So what do we tend to do? What's our human uh, tendency? Well, we tend to hold on to and give credence to the things that we agree with. Maybe we have an emotional connection to what's said or what's uh, being shown to us, and we cling to that. But that applies to uh, what we know and understand about who God is as well, not just the information. The main thing that comes to my mind is um, depictions of Jesus Christ in film or TV. Um, there's a standard depiction of Jesus Christ, usually with long hair, um, more towards a feminine aspect of of, of nature, um, quiet and and me and um, I don't want to say meek. He Christ was meek, um, weak. Let's say that weak and and uh, long hair, which is not not the accurate depiction of Jesus Christ, but when we see those things, uh, a lot of times it gets embedded into our brains. And that's the image we may have of Jesus Christ without us really realizing it. You know, that's something we have to fight against. That's, that's Satan's attempt to uh, get us to not to truly deceive us about who Christ was and is. But how does it, if we go back to the context of 1 John chapter 4, in the case that uh, John called out, he was talking about Christ not coming in the flesh. Right? That's, that was specifically what he said. Um, Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And that's the spirit of the Antichrist. Well, that entails a lot of understanding about who God is. If we say that Christ has come in the flesh, there's a lot of understanding that goes into that. Uh, and we won't get into all of it, but it's an understanding that, that Jesus Christ uh, was the Word. We, that's part of it. But also that Jesus Christ came and was fully man. That he was physical. And the implications of that are very profound. And it may seem like a subtle thing, uh, but it, it leads to more leaps in logic down the road. You know, It implies, obviously, there's an understanding that God was the Word. Um, it implies an understanding of the Godhead. You know, if we believe truly that Christ has come into the flesh, that does away with any belief in the Trinity. Because the Trinity uh, does not support the belief that Christ has come into the flesh. But if you believe that uh, in the Trinity, then you can't believe that Christ truly came in the flesh. The point being that what Paul or excuse me, John was saying is before we accept any idea, we must test the spirits, even when it comes to our understanding of who God is just the basics of understanding. To avoid the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world and that is, is growing as we approach the end time, we must know God truly and intimately. 
You know, to be off in our knowledge of God, who he is, the character of God, even, you know, believing that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh puts us under tremendous danger of sin. And it leads us to our next point, our next point, because a lot of false beliefs in the world today, uh, especially in Christianity, stem from a wrong belief in who God is, a wrong belief in knowing God. Um, Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians and we'll, as we start our next point. The first point was we need to better know God. Understand who God is, the character of God, the nature of God, the Father and Jesus Christ. In 2 Thessalonians 2 again, we'll start in verse 7. This is the same um, passage that Paul was talking about this man of sin that's going to appear at the end time. In verse 7, Paul says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The mystery of lawlessness uh, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Um, that We've talked about that uh, briefly. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. That's very important. That they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's interesting, did not believe the truth. We live in a world today where there's everybody has their own truth. Well, in reality, there's one truth. There's not, uh, there's not Devin's truth and Tiffany's truth. There is the truth, and it's a question of whether our lives or our beliefs line up with what the truth is. Uh, but the spirit of Antichrist is directly connected with the spirit of lawlessness. Lawlessness... Uh, the Greek word is anomia, I believe, and it means no law. Uh, and no law. The end time fulfillment of Antichrist will deceive people away from the truth. The truth of God. And it says here uh, in verse 10 of Second Thessalonians 2, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. There will be teaching lawlessness. And it's not something new. It's something John was combating when he mentioned Antichrist 1,900 years ago. Let's go to 1 John. Again, 2 Thessalonians was about a future uh, fulfillment of a man who will come on the scene uh, in, in the spirit of lawlessness, preaching against God's law, teaching against God's law. We're going to read a large section here in um, 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. John says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come out, come by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us. Remember, we talked, we read the other verse where they went out from us, implying that they were in the midst of the church. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they may be made manifest that none of them were of us. It was clear that they were not part of the body because they left the body. But if you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that the that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So here we have somebody who's a liar. And the truth contains no lie. And then he says, who is a liar but he who denies Jesus Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, is against truth. Anti-truth. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Christ said that himself. If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Therefore, 
Let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and the Father. What have they heard from the beginning? The truth. The truth. And this is the promise that He has promised us. Eternal life. What do we read in John 17 and verse 3? This is eternal life that you may know God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true concerning all things, and is not a lie, excuse me, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. Now, little children, abide in Him. When He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. In verse 29, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And when we were talking about the spirit of Antichrist denying that Christ has come in the flesh, it was a heresy that John was fighting, and we fight today. You know, this this, uh, thought that stems from an uh, improper belief or understanding of who God is, um, but the thought process that went on in John's day was the thought process that Christ was not really a physical man. And there are different variations of that. Um, One of them is that Jesus Christ only seemed to have a body. He didn't really have a body, but it was like a hologram, a projection, because it was a belief that the physical was evil and corrupt, and so you know God could never be in, in the physical. And that's an idea called docetism, and it's a belief that's even held today. Um, another belief is uh, that Jesus Christ was a man, or Jesus was a man, and Christ, or God, entered this physical body at baptism and left just before that physical body died. That he wasn't really physical, but he inhabited uh, a physical person. These are some, some sounding, it sounds crazy to think about or talk about, but those are ideas that were Uh, beginning in John's time, even before John's time, he was trying to combat uh, and continue to us today. But where does this train of thought lead? Well, the the thought process goes, since this was not, this person, Jesus Christ, was not really a man, but God, that it was the fact that he was God that allowed him not to sin. That's the only reason why he couldn't sin, because he was God. And so he kept the law for us. Maybe you see where I'm going. So we no longer have to keep the law. Starts from a corrupted idea of who God is, not believing that Jesus Christ came into the flesh, and leads to the path of, we don't have to keep the law. How often do we hear this heresy, this deception? That's contrary to truth. It's all around us. It's prevalent in many churches uh, that call themselves Christians today. And yet, I mean, we look at what Jesus Christ himself said, Matthew, uh, when the rich ruler comes in and said, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Keep the commandments. Pretty simple. But think of all the things that are contrary to truth. That's just one idea uh, as far as uh, not having to keep the law. That's one idea of, of that's contrary to truth. But think of all the things that are contrary to the truth in varying degrees. You know, we read these things about uh Jesus Christ being a hologram. And we think, well, that's obviously off. That's 90 degrees off this way or 180 degrees off this way. But what about the things that are fractions of a degree off? That, that my wife and uh, my sister and my brother-in-law, they call me pedantic because I'm very particular about a lot of times on how I say things or how things are worded and they kind of get frustrated sometimes. But sometimes it's very important because even one word uh, conveyed in the wrong way is off of truth, of complete truth. I I heard a sermon once, maybe 10 years ago. It was during the Days of Love and Bread, um, and the person giving the sermon was talking about Charles Lindbergh and his transatlantic flight. And um, it was a very interesting story he was using, but um, during his transatlantic flight, he had a compass. And that's, it was, uh, we don't have aviation equipment like we do now. He had to take a heading. Right to determine what direction to go, and he did it every I think five or ten minutes, whatever the case was, because if he was off at any point by more than uh, even a degree, 
over the course of thousands of miles, he would have completely missed his target by hundreds of miles, just being off by a degree. And he would have been off and he would have ran out of fuel and he would have died. And he made the analogy of we can't be off. And I thought it was very, it stuck in my mind because that's the case. You know, it's easy sometimes for us to cite the big uh, uh, lies, the big um, deceptions. But the small deceptions that are just slightly off are just as dangerous, just like a, a, a slight Im- improper uh, belief on who God is. And look where it led. Well, you can believe God the way you want to believe. I'll believe the way I want to leave. Well, look at the train of thought, and it led to lawlessness, transgression of God's law. It's nothing new, um, but what it ties back to is we should really um, know the truth and beyond that, love the truth. Love the truth. Know and love the truth. There are many deceptions that are around us today, and it plagues the church of God. Uh, Many deceptions that can sound reasonable, that are derived from Scripture, but it's a twisting or an improper uh, interpretation of Scripture. And But you can make it sound quite good. I think of some of the major issues that they're cyclical, they come back every once in a while, um, calendars, the different calendars that come through the church. That can be a very hot-button issue. And you listen to somebody and all the research someone does and you think, well, that that sounds pretty good. I can't find a flaw in the logic or uh, new moons or sacred names or these, these things that come through. Uh, the messianic movement is, is big within the world, but it's also uh, gaining a foothold within the church of God. And I've known several people who've kind of drifted off that way. Um, Maybe it's a sidebar, but it's 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 disheartening to see, because there's a lot of issues with the, that movement. Um, a lot of them actually dealing with uh, who God is, identity of Jesus Christ, and the nature of God. A lot of the messianic movements uh, believe Christ may be a created being of some sort. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them are are um, along those lines as far as the belief. But they they bring back things like tassels, phylacteries. The things that we can read in Scripture. Well, it sounds, I mean, it's from Scripture. You know, for instance, uh, tassels that you may see somebody wear. Uh, It's from Scripture. What's wrong with doing that? It's just parts of garments that were to remind God's people of his law. It seems innocent enough, except it denies the power of God the Father through Jesus Christ, ultimately. Uh, Jesus Christ dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit. That's the power we have to remember God's law. It's written in our hearts and our minds, not in in a piece of cloth. Um, Again, that's a side note. Anyway, the spirit of Antichrist is against truth. And and it doesn't matter. Satan doesn't care if it gets you 90 degrees off or a fraction of a degree off. If he gets you off a little bit, then our whole course is going off. Our struggle is to stay in the truth. To stay in the truth. Strive to properly understand God's word, which is the only source of truth. And everything that we hear and we listen to and we read has to be filtered through God's word. Has to be. It seems like it's an overwhelming task, and it really is, but it's that important that we do that. And the truth of practicing righteousness. You know, we can't allow deceptions to pull us away from living God's way of life. Uh, It's very difficult. We struggle with these things. And really it leads to our next point um, because we can't do it on our own. And the next point is we need to rely on God. The first point was we need to better know and understand God. second point was we need to uh, better understand uh, the truth and have a love for the truth. But we also need to realize that we need to rely completely on God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to look into the... It's really amazing to think about this because what prophecy is. Prophecy is is um, history written in advance. The things that we're going to read are going to happen, uh, which is just mind-boggling to think about. But we're going to look into the future, which we can do because God inspired this. <clears throat> Excuse me, in Revelation chapter 13... 
God inspired these words, and we're going to look at what it's going to be like in the future. And we're going to get insight onto where um, people of the world, where their priorities are, where their reliance is, and then we're going to see where our reliance should be. So Revelation 13 and verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. The imagery here is of a false religion, like a lamb. Jesus Christ is a lamb, but it's not a lamb. It speaks like a dragon, which is uh, Satan. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Not worship God, but worship the first beast <clears throat> whose uh, deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceived those who dwell on the earth by those signs which were, he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. It's interesting, granted to do. Without God allowing it, it never would have come to pass anyway. But um, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should uh, both speak and cause many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And in verse 17, And that they that no one may buy or sell except one has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Think about that. What's the controlling? It's controlling trade, buying and selling. Because if you don't have this mark on your hand or your, or your forehead, um, on your head, you can't buy or sell. Buy or sell. It, it just came into my head here, but what did we read about uh, uh, when you read about Satan in the Old Testament, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, uh, through the abundance of your uh, trading. The abundance of your trading, your merchandise. It's a system of things. Let's go to uh, Revelation 18. We'll get more insight into this because it's uh, it's about commerce. It's about um, the reliance on uh, physical things, on riches. And this beast power, which is uh, a political system powered by Satan will provide great wealth for many people. And they'll come to adore this beast power because of the wealth that is provided. And that's where their reliance and their, their focus is of the, of the nations at the end time. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 3, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And this is talking about uh, Babylon, the end time system and have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. The world is going to become physically rich through this end time system that's going to come. In verse 7, In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, a luxurious life, abundance of, of wealth, uh, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. You know, it, um, it's w sometimes when we have we're at our richest and our, and uh, most physically abundant that we're at our spiritually weakest, because we are physical beings and we see these physical uh, things that we have as uh, as strengths, and we rely on that. and And that's saying, I will see, I will not suffer, I won't see sorrow. Think of all the abundance that I have as a system of Babylon. Verse nine. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. Standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment have come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. The source of their wealth is gone. God destroyed it. They relied on her to get their abundance, and it's no more. And they weep and lament. 
and the merchants of the earth, we read that, merchants of gold and silver, talking about some of the things that they were trading and selling with this uh, Babylon system. This um, really is, is a habitation of foul things. It's a really demented place. But because it made them rich, uh, they committed fortification with her. And look, look at the list of things that they sold. Gold and silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linens, purple, silk, scarlet, of every kind, citron wood, every kind, object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, and wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies and souls of men. Even slavery, selling people. In verse... Um, 14, and the fruit of your soul longed, and the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. What did they long for? They longed for these physical riches, this abundance. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. That's going to be taken away. The merchants of these things who became very rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. And saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple, scarlet, adorned with rich, with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour has such great riches come to nothing. And every shipmaster who will travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the seas, stood at a distance and cried out, like they saw the smoke of her burning, which is great. Uh, What is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing. You know, that's brings to mind uh, they weep and wail over the loss of their uh, golden goose, so to speak. Instead, they should have thrown sackcloth, uh, put sackcloth on, put dust on their head in repentance to God. Instead, they were, they're mourning the loss of their golden goose. The city which all who had ships in the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Think about that as far as where those people's minds and hearts were. They were on physical things. Physical or will be. This is a future fulfillment. Let's go now back to um, first or Second John as we're talking about this. Um, because as, things, as time goes on, I think we can look in our world around us and we're, we're very, our human nature, as was mentioned, is very greedy. We want physical things. And we're physical. It makes sense to look for physical things, but that's not what our, where our, our reliance should be on. The strength of men is not going to save us. God will save us. And the spirit of Antichrist is against Jesus Christ, against God the Father. Uh, and so as far as turning to physical things is in the same, the same vein as the spirit of Antichrist, drawing you away from God the Father, drawing us away from Jesus Christ. Back in 2 John, we're going to read, uh, it's, there's only one chapter, we're going to read verses 4 to 11. In verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking in truth. We just talked about that. The importance of uh, knowing and loving the truth and walking according to that truth, living our lives, as we receive commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you. John said, this is nothing new but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And the degree, what we said earlier in the first point, to the degree that we know and understand and and act on the love of God towards God and man is to the degree we understand and know who God is. In verse 6, This is the love that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk into in it. Verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming, as coming in the flesh. The last time we read that was in 1 John. It says, has come, past tense. This is as coming, present uh, present perfect, I, th- I think is the way it's, the actual phrase of what it actually is, meaning it's a continual process. It's continually happening. And we'll touch on that a little more here as we after we read these verses. Um, 
This is a deceiver and antichrist. Look to yourself that we do not lose those things which you worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. What does it mean to have the Father and the Son? We have God the Father and the Son in us through the Holy Spirit. In verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Think about that. He who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Uh, If someone comes to you, even greeting them, uh, for instance, a word, again, this may be pedantic, but saying goodbye. Goodbye is origins, it means Godspeed. It means God be with you. So if someone comes to you preaching, uh, uh, says, does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, don't even say goodbye to him. Because you're sharing in his evil deeds. You're saying God be with you as you preach false doctrines. It may seem small, but that's what it's saying. He who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So here we have John is saying, uh, you know, walk as Christ walked. If you, um, he who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. And we read in verse 7 um, that the Antichrist does not confess to Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Again, that's present perfective. And it's talking about Jesus Christ coming in the flesh through the Holy Spirit through the dwelling in us. Uh, let's go to John chapter 5. These all tie together because we read, we talked about knowing God and it says every spirit who does not confess that Christ came in the flesh as a deceiver or an antichrist um, and the, we followed that train of thought. And it's that train of thought led to um, you know, improper understanding of God and also an improper understanding of Jesus Christ being fully man. And that has further implications um, as we can read in in John chapter 5 and verse 30. What Christ says here. says, I can of myself do nothing. I can of myself do nothing as I hear a judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. If we have a proper understanding that Jesus Christ came fully in the flesh, was fully man, Then we look to his example as fully relying on and submitting to God the Father, just as we need to fully rely and submit to God the Father. If Jesus Christ did not come and and was not fully man, if he was uh, some sort of God, human, uh, you know, either a projection or whatever the case may be, then that does away with the fact that Jesus Christ Uh, was fully man, was tempted as we are tempted, and yet without sin. So how did Jesus Christ avoid sinning? Well, if Christ was fully man, where did his strength and ability to overcome sin? He he overcame it in the sense that he prevented it from happening in himself. He fully relied on God through the Holy Spirit. He He had the Spirit without measure. And the same must be true for us. You know, as the end time gets closer, uh, you know, people are going to be focused on riches and the wealth that's coming from this end time system. Our focus and reliance needs to be on God the Father. Just as Christ, while he was on this earth, fully relied on God the Father and everything that he said, everything that he did. You know, the idea being that in in, uh, 2 John 1, 7, the present perfected, that Christ dwells within us through the Holy Spirit, has is coming in the flesh continually. That's an idea we have to understand. The, the power and the essence of God dwells within us. That's where our reliance needs to be, not on ourself. You know, God has given us the tools to overcome sin, the same tools that Jesus Christ had. He didn't have anything... Uh, better than us. He didn't have a leg up. He fully relied more than any man ever has on God the Father to follow the commandments, to walk in love. And that's where the admission for us needs to be as well. We can't be diverted away from relying on God to relying on uh, anything. 
our own selves uh, or physical riches, thinking that that will save us. We have to rely fully on God more and more as the end time approaches. More and more as the end time approaches. Let's turn to Matthew 24 as, as we begin to wrap up. The reason for this uh, message, I, I gave it in Springfield a few weeks ago, um, but the purpose today was not to assign identity to the, who the Antichrist is. That's not the purpose of the message today, but it's to serve as a reminder of the intent of the Scripture. The intent of the Scripture. The end result of what we should use the Scripture for, to apply God's Word into our life, to change our life, to become more like God. Uh, To put these words that we read today about the Antichrist um, in an outward focus, if I can use that, the who, the what, the when of the Antichrist um, does not contribute necessarily to our spiritual growth. The way we contribute to our spiritual growth when we read these things is if we turn our focus inwardly on what lessons we can learn from the passages that we read today. So let's let's read in Matthew 24 and verse 24. It says, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonder so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Deception is rampant. It it was rampant in Christ's day, in John's day, even down to us today, and it grows worse and worse and worse. Worse and worse and worse. And it's prophesied to be growing worse as we get closer to the end time. This is the admonition. To avoid this deception. Avoid being deceived. Avoid the spirit of Antichrist. Will there be an end time figure uh, who, who has the title of the Antichrist? Yes. The Bible makes it clear there is an article, the Antichrist uh, will come. That's why we know it's the end time. Yet that's not, our, that's not where our focus should be. More importantly, the spirit of Antichrist is already prevalent in society and in the midst, even in the church of God today. John dealt with it. It wasn't new to him. He said the Antichrist left them. They were in the midst of the body. I say in the midst because likely it's not part of the body, but in the midst as far as dwelling among the body. But it's prevalent today. So what do we learn from this? We must learn to guard ourselves from the deceptions associated with the Antichrist that have been around for hundreds of years. That is doctrines against Jesus Christ, against God the Father, as the word means, adversary or against Christ. And as we read, uh, the spirit of Antichrist denies God the Father and denies Jesus Christ to some degree or another. So we we looked at some of those ways today. We looked at three ways that we need to defend ourselves against these deceptions. We need to get to know God, to understand the nature and character of God intimately. So we won't be deceived by imposters that come up. Not as we see God, as we want to see God, but as God reveals himself in his word. That's how we need to know God. As God reveals himself through his word. We need to know the truth. And beyond that, love the truth. Better understand God's word. The instructions that are given. The perfect law. Understand God's perfect law. Because more and more, there's a spirit of anti-law, lawlessness, that's growing in the world. We need to hold on to that dearly with, for the precious truth that it is. Finally, on our list, we reminded ourselves to rely on God fully, just as Jesus Christ did. We need to understand our own personal weaknesses and then submit ourselves to God the Father. Look to the perfect example of Jesus Christ in submitting to the Father. We can't be distracted by physical wealth or the physical abundance that we have uh, today in America. It's, it's astounding to think about, but how easy it can be to turn our focus away from God onto the physical things. The physical things that God blesses us with can sometimes be a distraction from God himself. The struggle is not easy, brethren, and it's going to grow harder and harder. So 
what, as we take this from today, I pray that God will bless each and every one of us in these efforts. And by his power, we can overcome the spirit of Antichrist.